Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar in association with the Agile Business Conference, which is actually exactly a week away today. Uh, the webinar theme today is Startup versus Corporate Strength Agile, and its subtitle, Not All Agile is Created Equal. The presenters uh, today are Manav Meehan and Stephen Grafton. And Manav and Stephen are from Tata Consultancy Services, who coincidentally are also the headline sponsor of the Agile Business Conference this year. They both have very deep experience of Agile across many organizations, and I'm delighted they're joining us to share some of that experience today and, and hopefully provide you with some new and thought-provoking ideas. Uh, if you would like to know more about the conference, just to, to mention the website is agileconference.org. What I'll do now is hand over to Manav and Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alec. Uh, so we'll just make a start. I think the numbers are looking good. Uh, we always find that you put a controversial topic out there and people do want to hear about that. So yes, we have got a point of view, which me and Stephen would cover in a minute. Uh, I, just a very brief about the title. Uh, I was actually rolled in front of an of a exec board and asked to explain that why are we doing the Agile the way we are doing? Because they had recently acquired a company and they were surely doing something more quick time to market and the kind of Agile we were implementing took a bit longer. So that was sort of where the topic came up and we'll just share our experiences around uh, that that particular instance and a few others. So. Hence, we said not all Agile is created equal. And for those of you who are practitioners, would have seen this already, that given that the market, of, the marketplace of Agile has been in its entirety more than a decade or 12, 15 years now, even in, in, in its current form, that there's various flavors out there. Yeah. So anything? Yeah, I, I'm from... To cover as much ground today, and I, I think if you want questions answered, you you can uh, ping them to the Moderate. facilitators who will let us know, and we'll try and work that through. Yes, so I think the, the the idea would be that if if we are able to weave that answer into the presentation, then we shall do that. Uh, otherwise, we'll come back to it towards the end. Uh, just these are just uh, we didn't know whether the webcam would work or not, so we put our faces up there. Uh, but probably <laughs> you can see our faces uh, if you have that facility. Uh, I think what we'll probably give are different our different perspectives, um, along with some thoughts and models and ideas that are sort of, um, being floated around in the agile community uh, anyway. Yeah. So we've been with TCS, uh, I mean, around two to three years now in in the consulting part of TCS. So although sort of consulting services has a consulting word in there, what we do is more on what we can say the management consulting side, and also. Uh, just to put things in perspective, Tata is, is quite a big brand. Uh, it owns Jaguar Land Rover in this country. So. And Tetley and Chorus. Yeah, it's, a, it's quite a big setup. So just to put things in perspective. So we end up dealing with large corporate organizations, and hence uh, the viewpoints we'll share today. Yeah. So I, will, I thought I'll start with a quote. I had read something similar quite a while back, but couldn't quite find it when I put it into a search engine like Bing or Yahoo or the third one, which many okay, people sure. escapes me yes um, I, I think it's important to say that the problem we face today is nothing to do with process or technology that was what was the industrial revolution in the past but actually it's more around people so if we can enable people to do the right thing especially in software and system space 
then I think the rest will fall in line. So Agile certainly provides a framework which at the heart of it is inspection and adoption. It's also important to understand that there are no final answers here. Actually, it's a framework. It has some guiding principles. And everyone in their own situation, whether it's a project, program, organization, need to find those final answers. And hopefully, we'll take you a bit closer to doing that today. Yeah. And I like that last line, which is uh, often you'll find people say, look, I, I know we need to be agile because I've been told I need to be agile. Uh, can you write me a process manual of how to do that? The answer is no. Yeah. Great. So what is Agile? Well, and why people do bother with Agile? So we'll talk with the first section. We'll just give you some industry point of views. So the, this is a, uh, an annual survey done by one of the tool companies, version one. And they have various reasons why people go agile. And the one which comes top actually has been for a few years is accelerated time to market, which is not getting things out there quicker, incidentally. No. I think what, what's interesting about this is it is a, a tools vendor perspective. So when it says Agile delivers on what's important, I think that's better framed as uh, Agile people deliver on what's important. And when you talk about accelerated time to market, that's about how you engage with customers and about getting quick and rapid feedback from what you're doing, rather than here's this big list of requirements, now use Agile and get it done quicker, <coughs> because that's not what Agile is about. Yeah. And we don't want to give you any roast-tinted view of the world here. So the next one is a bit of a reality check, that there are good 30% people who say, actually, Agile forces us down the path of lack of upfront planning and loss of management control. Now, anyone who's, who's had Agile experience and done it correctly would, would look at this number and say, that's not quite true. In some sense, Agile has more discipline and rigor, and it has more planning points. It's just that it's done differently. Yes. I think the interesting thing about, you know, <laughs> Our projects fail because we don't do any planning. And um, Agile doesn't mean you don't do any planning. What it means is you do just enough planning. And the difficulty is training and coaching people into what just enough means. Mm. And again, just enough for what Steve's project or program or organization might be different to mine. So again, there are no universal answers here. Uh, just another point of view here is that people still go and they are still adopting Agile. So there are some benefits which people have seen. And interestingly, the top one is not about getting out there quicker. It's actually ability to man manage changing priorities. And then the list certainly goes down uh, with increased productivity and several others. And actually, fast time to market, in terms of the benefit realized, is a little bit halfway down the house. So that's more probably realistic to what we've seen. And I think the ability to manage changing priorities is an interesting one. So. Uh, and where I've, I've worked a fair bit now, um, is what, what, what is it that you're changing the priority of? And part of the way in which you want this uh, sort of more of a, an enterprise agile perspective to work is um, a real focus on earned value and what is it that you value. So if you are presenting your teams with something from the business that is not uh, easily chunkable and deliverable, um, and uh, the, you know, have the priorities changed in it, then you may as well, I don't know, I was going to say may as well do the waterfall. <laughs> but uh, I think uh, if you look at the Kinevin framework, the, um, the, the software delivery process is still quite creative. It's not something where you know exactly when you start building something what you're going to end up building. So you need a framework which actually helps you acknowledge that that's what's going to happen from the start and adapt, and that's what uh, Agile is trying to do. Mm. And I think the following slide really does paint the right picture here, because most of the organizations today have had at least dipped their toes into one or the other Agile method, and at least they have a viewpoint. I'll be very surprised uh, when we go into transformation program. There are very few people who say, oh, well, can I have one of Agile, please? Uh, a lot of people would say, either have challenges to scale, or uh, my Agile implementation isn't giving me the desired benefit. So this is another uh, perspective on uh, that from version one, where they said it is about the culture. So and, and a lot of organization culture, incidentally, 
is down to people. Yeah, one of the things which I've uh, recognized or noticed recently is when you've got an organization that says, right, we're going to go agile, often that transformation is pointed at the delivery solution, delivery software, delivery organization. And you've got a set of processes and a culture which actually has got stuff aligned and that the, the business and software development organization have probably got some folks between who are doing the translation. When you start introducing Agile but you only focus on the software delivery aspect, what you actually are doing is driving the culture of the software delivery process away from the business. And actually, unless you address that business side of things as well, you can, you can make things worse. So people start saying, well, what's my job now? How do we communicate? I don't know what's going on. Um, and it's, it's uh, part of this difference between startup and scale is all part of that uh, process. And we've got some slides on that later. Yeah. And also, just one other point of view is that a lot of organization culture, as she was mentioning, is, is also doing things more of end to end. So if you only do the bit in the middle, which is, let's say, design, build, and test, which a lot of people fairly comfortable doing Agile with, well, that will only give you local optimum. So it, we need to think of optimizing the whole of the value stream so that it's not just about quicker delivery, it's about quicker value realization. Yes, uh, from the portfolio all the way to, to continuous delivery. Yeah. So that's sort of painting the picture of why people still go for Agile and what are the key challenges. Now, we'll spend about quick five minutes around level setting of what Agile is anyway, because there are lots of definitions out there. It's literally an umbrella term with a set of behaviors. It has a manifesto in the background. And as I said, it's a framework within which you inspect and adapt. You have a lot of tools. Uh, you have a lot of methods. And this list is ever growing because of the popularity. Yeah. Now, Manab knows I don't like the, so mm -hmm. the ad the top left there, where yeah. it says it's adaptive, goal-driven, iterative, lean, and all that. Although it may be all of those things. Um, that term was, was coined by a bunch of folk at a ski resort who thought, we've all got this common experience, all got these common things that we see working, what do we call it? <coughs> and Agile was the best they could come up with at the time. Hmm. And they probably wanted it to call lightweight method or something. Like, yeah, lightweight. Yeah. And the timeline on that is also that the term itself was coined around 2001. So if anyone says Agile is completely brand new shiny thing, it's actually not. It, uh, we did another session where we explained how it's crossed the chasm. So people who are more risk adverse, uh, the people who would uh, are more in the laggards and late adopter category are now certainly adopting it in a big, big way. So just generally a timeline view on that and the ideology. Uh, very quickly, just another view of how, I'll just make it very quickly, from traditional we moved on to what is now called as agile and maybe looping back a little bit. Yeah, and I think the some people um, misconstrue Agile as doing what we used to do, but just doing it in smaller chunks. And where there is value in that, um, people tend to, where there's a lot of process, want to follow as much of it as possible. So a lot of the Rational Unified process has, what, I don't know, 137, 140 yeah. bits and pieces that you could choose to follow. Um, and people would say, well, therefore, we have to follow all of it, which mm -hmm. simply wasn't true. Um, where you get Scrum, there are, what, seven basic things that you need to follow? Well, it's and three by three model. Yeah, and then it is just not sufficient. So part of what we try to do with people is help them build their own models depending on their, their own circumstances, because every company is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we want hammer the point any further, I mean, most of you guys would have seen a variant of that. I think it's important to also look at that there is a manifesto. Uh, again, you probably would have seen that, otherwise you can look it up. Uh, it's a value statement in there, and there are some principles underpinning that. So that's really what Agile is. And we still have people who are saying, well, can I have one of Agile? Well, no, it doesn't work. You need to see which flavor would you want and how many of these principles and values at what trajectory can you implement in uh, in the organization. Which brings us to an interesting point around Scrum. And you cannot have any agile discussion without reference to Scrum. And I tried to look at the recent numbers. I couldn't find them. But it's a bit representative where people try and use agile. Somewhere or the other, they use Scrum. 
And the reason they do that is is a very, very simple framework. And again, this is not a scrum session, but you start with a backlog, you do some planning, you do a time box, and you deliver something potentially shippable. Now, interestingly, there's a lot of discussion around flow, Kanban ways of working, but then a lot of those people have graduated to first getting the discipline of time box, which means get something out there and then potentially sort of make it good. So you cannot ignore Scrum, but then that's not the only answer. The problem we have nowadays is people, quite a bit, are just anchoring back to Scrum and Scrum is the only way of doing things. Yes, the question people ask is how do we scale Scrum? And the answer is you don't, right? Scrum says nothing about scale. Yeah. So the question then becomes how do we coordinate multiple Scrum teams and what's a product backlog anyway and how do we design products and what's value and goodness me, what this scaling stuff is all a bit tricky. Yeah. And also I think, so you might be thinking if you guys have tried some sort of scale Scrum around Scrum or Scrum, that just one of the component parts of scaling. If you look at this model and you just put multiple variants of this and then at multiple levels, that on itself or in itself will not get you to a good it's very much huddled together, get things out there quickly. So we thought these are some of the attributes of what is a startup agile. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the original point of Scrum is every two weeks, make something live. Yeah. That's now come to, well, make it, you know, get something that's potentially live, but we'll only ship it every six months. Which yeah. sort of gets away from that original core lean sort of model. Yeah. So I think in about 15 minutes, we've touched upon what, where we've come from. I think what we really do want to give you is, is how we think things are heading and what we have seen in our experience moving to a corporate strength, agility. And the important thing here is, again, it's not about agile, it's about the behavior agility. So one of the first things is to try and compare and contrast frameworks. And you might have seen some of these uh, mixes used in your organizations. There is a team focus and there's an enterprise focus. and these practices are either at the engineering, management, or the program level. Important thing is on the right hand side, if you are starting to look at the behavior attributes of an organization, then maybe just one method will not suffice. I know there are lots of people making some claims around one size fits all. But I, yeah, yeah, no, I think that's true. I think one of the things to be wary of is where people have taken a lot of good practice and labeled it as a particular way of doing things, that's not the end game. The, the end game is to be an adaptive inspect and adapt process improvement organization. So if you're looking at DSDM or SAFE or DAD or LESS or any of those methods, that just helps you frame where you want to get to. The problem is if it's seen as if you just follow these processes, you will be agile. So don't mistake a rather well-framed set of, uh, I don't know, processes, approaches, tools, templates with a process that if you haven't got the people who are behaving in the right way in your organization, it doesn't matter how good that framework is. Yep. And this is why I think we, the first statement we put out there is there are no final answers. There are pointers. Uh, and, and some of these combinations, like DSGM has been around for a very, very long time. The recent version of it has dropped the word Aten, actually, and it's yeah. primarily uh, focusing and encompassing Scrum also in its entirety. So there, these are good frameworks, but then could you implement just one of them? We haven't quite found that magic one. We, we found magic potions. Yeah. I know. And depending where you go, it's not just about delivering software. You've got the you know, procurement, risk, um, release management, PMO, 
governance, sponsors, money, all mm. that all that stuff needs to fit around what it is you're trying to do. Yeah. So which brings us to the point that you can't just pick and well, you can't just plug and play agile. What you need to have is a transformational approach. And there's a proven model from Cotter which can be used for any sort of change, any sort of organizational change. And we use the same one quite a lot and by all means you can define that for your organization to create the change climate, engage the organization, implement, sustain that change. So again, we can go on for hours on this particular slide, but you get the idea that this, it is transformational nature. It is about being agile, it's not just about doing agile. Now, you start to do that and you start to see things start to creak up a little bit. Yeah, I quite like this. So this is from uh, Richard Donnell, who's a ThoughtWorks chap. But what's interesting is I've, I've seen this uh, quite close, which is when you're doing a startup, you've got your people and your tools. Um, everything's quite close to the customer. There's nobody in the way. You're trying to get stuff out quick, prove that it works. And the whole startup way of thinking is really tied up into, into those things. So the first thing that starts when you sort of throw Agile at those sorts of teams is the people break. Uh, you get someone like me or my app turn up, a big coach, and um, people push back. They make noise, some adapt, others don't. But I think it's one of the easiest things to get through. People tend to uh, understand. So there's a, you will probably have, certainly um, where I, one of the places I worked, that we had a quite an extensive education and training sessions, but then a one-on-one -on -one coaching, setting up teams, making sure people understood how to do things. Um, and that's, that's generally, people can be quite successful at that. If people go through Agile transformations, they see some of that success, they think, oh great, uh, Jimmy over there, he really gets this. Uh, but then you get to the, the tools, uh, the tools start breaking. Um, so all of the collaboration tools, the existing development tools, the, you, all the way in which you actually write your software starts to break. And the people who um, pay for things say, well, we've got all these really expensive tools, don't we need them anymore? <laughs> And, and the people go, no, we need all this new stuff. We need this continuous integration. We need all of these, uh, we need um, whatever it is, Microsoft, so that we can, what do you call it, the Microsoft project, isn't it? Not a project, what do you yeah, call it? Team Foundation Server. Team Foundation Server, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. I'm glad you're on the ball. <laughs> so, you know, we, we, we need TFS. We need to have um, something that enables our communication and our scrums and all that good stuff. Um, and sometimes, the you know, getting the organization to approve a large amount of spend for something which is, well, it's just a process, isn't it, can be quite difficult. Mm -hmm. But I do think that um, tools can be a constraint, but I think people generally find that not too hard to get through. Uh, but then you hit the governance. So our uh, waterfall projects, uh, you've got lovely Gantt charts and things are read and every couple of weeks as a status report comes out. You've got lots of metrics, probably. Uh, none of those metrics will be useful, and nobody actually ever actions them, but you get that feeling that you're in control because you've got all these metrics. Um, in the best case, um, you can see where teams go um, agile, they just measure velocity. Mm -hmm. But that makes, that makes people who are providing the money really, really uncomfortable uh, because they will say, when am I going to get this stuff I'm paying my money for? And bad Agile teams will say, we can't tell you we're Agile, go away, we'll just give you what we're going to give you. Mm -hmm. But you do need some framework around helping communicate to stakeholders about when they can expect stuff, and then start the focus on the customer stuff, which then breaks because the customer being your, uh, I guess in the scrum term, your product owner, it's no longer write us a big list of requirements and go away. We need access to you 24-7, actually, because we're going to ask you um, lots of questions and those questions are about not just what are the things we need to implement but why are we doing this what's the value um, we want to we want to write less software and provide more value um, why can't we get this done quicker why can't we get this to the customer quicker so often that product owner comes from and I hate I hate this term really from the business side of the equation um, and it's not the business it's us so they need to be part of the team and if your organization is following Conway's law, um, 
you will stop at that point. So governance is the first point where things start to come to a halt. You get some benefit because you've got the teams that are collaborating, writing software, but you haven't got that connection with the customer. And then, of course, your financial controls break. Um, they sh shouldn't have to because when you're setting up a project, you should be able to say, well, what's my vision? What is it? What's the outcomes I'm looking for? And the outcomes are, you know, I want 5% more customers buying this stuff, not I want X, Y, and Z implemented. So what you really want from your business sponsors, the people giving you the money at that point, is if I give you a million pounds to build this, when am I going to get my outcome, not when am I going to get these 15 things that I think I'm paying for. Because if as a team you can develop five of them and get them to the outcome for half the money, surely that's better. So, and I mean this is an important point because think it's not agile doesn't help you get things out there quicker. It actually focuses on the highest value items. So hopefully, if you're doing it right, it should be able to deliver more yeah. value. Quicker. Yeah, I think so. And the, the great thing about this is, I've worked in in teams where we've done waterfall projects trying to measure earned value. Mm which is impossible because you're trying to say, I've done 83% of this project, we've produced no software, yep. what's your earned value? Well, the honest answer is zero. zero. Yeah. Whereas um, I was talking to a team that were doing a load of work on web portals to try and improve customer click-throughs, as in, you know, we only 45% of people, when they go through this journey, end up buying something. We want to improve that. Mm. If you create a project that have got 10 ideas and you do them all, you have no idea what the benefit is, and you probably have to wait three months before you stick them in line. Mm. The point that they recognized when they started doing it, got quite excited by, is you can apply each small change, make it live, look at the impact that has, then look at the list of all the possible things you could do and prioritize the things that are having the most impact quicker. Mm. So you are getting value quicker, and you're getting value. You haven't got to wait such a long time for it. But that takes quite We've got an agile feature team that de develops it, delivers it into operations in a one continuous and effective flow. Have we minimized the number of handoffs through that process? Probably not. You've probably got a technical organization which is based on components and platforms. So the whole organizational change then is the last thing which breaks and um, is an impediment to that sort of final step of an effective value chain. That was me talking for quite a lot. Then. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take on the next one then. I think, <laughs> so what do you do then? I think, let's introduce you to another framework which we quite like around Schneider's model. And what he tried to explain here is how do we do things here? So what's the organizational culture like? Now quite often, in a bit more of a waterfall we're working, you find a control heavy structure and there's lesser collaboration, even lesser cultivation. There's a bit of competence around, no doubt about that. Now, when you start to turn the dial and, and create an agile enterprise, the challenge here is how do you make it more collaborative, get people more cultivating, which means actually we are growing our people. We are trying things out. And one of the things that Agile says very well is, if, I don't know whether we'll make you successful or not, but if this is going to fail, we'll get out of it quicker and then we'll have to do something about it. So. Keeping those sorts of things in mind, how do you then shift more from control centric but not completely go away because this is where a bit of governance, a little bit of, of checks and balances goes a long way and, and if you're working in a heavy regulated industry, you might need to see how your regular collaboration, regular cultivation and a bit of competence feeds into that in a very natural way rather than going and looking for a rule book. Yes. So, I agree. Right. What we wanted to do was, looking at the quick time check, just introduce some of the scaling models. We are not going to go in depth with these, but then there are some answers out there. They will not necessarily be the ones which will solve all your problems today. 
but essentially you can reference them. Yeah. Uh, scaled Agile Framework by Dean Liffingwell is one of the models uh, which uh, is gaining popularity. Yeah, a lot. And I think he's talking the Agile Business Conference, I think. Yeah, as well. I think he is, yes. So he did a keynote last time. So this is his model. Uh, lots of good stuff in there, uh, but then would you follow this model to the letter? Uh, well, take your pick if you think if, if it solves all your problems. And I, I, I think the guys that, that, that get this stuff say, look, here's, here's something which at an executive level they can get their heads around. Yes. I think the, the thing to get across is this is not the end game. Right. And none of these are the end game. And, and again, if you, if you do a bit of a web search, you'll find a different point of views on how people are using that. But essentially, uh, it's a model of others. So another one is around, that, as we said, dynamic systems development method, which you have a lot more roles and a little bit more of rigor in terms of the way you apply that. So both of these, you would normally go top down, whereas Scrum is a bit more of middle out to bottom yeah. up. And I've certainly been uh, in an organization where the the, the, so the team side of things, um, it's got the DSDM uh, rigor and discipline, hmm. but with a Scrum delivery engine. And that works uh, pretty well for us. So um, I think the thing you need to be thinking through for your organization is what is the enterprise wrapper you want to use. Now, you used, there are two which we already shared, like the SAFE and DSDM. And then you can use a bespoke one where you start to scale up. So you create cross-functional teams. All of them are being fed through a single prioritized backlog. Yep. And yep, essentially, you can start to scale and look and start to introduce a bit more of, of rigor and governance on, on an as-needed basis. You also have, so you can have product owners, yep. product owners, typical scaling of Scrum model. Uh, you also have that. Yeah, and I think what's interesting is this is, this is again, so uh, the um, I think it's the IBM yes. Mr. Power. Yeah. I can't <coughs> sorry. Oh, Scott Ambler. Scott Ambler. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> That's taking me looking like a more of an idiot than I am. And I think what's interesting with this is if you just look at those goals, is that's the sort of stuff <coughs> at a, an enterprise level or a corporate level that you need to get in place and understand before you start your sprints. So the idea that you don't identify your risk, that you don't have a team in place, or that you don't have some sort of idea of what you're going to release when, is just not right. You, you know, to be able to go to uh, your CFO and say, give me five million quid and I'll let you know when I spent it, isn't going to be enough. So you do need to do enough work up front to satisfy these sorts of, um, these sorts of goals. Yeah. So I think looking at the time, we'll start to sort of funnel it in to what is our last slide and then open it up for questions, is around what do you do then? So. <laughs> We have been asked this question several times, as you can as you can imagine. And what we do is we point back to the manifesto, which had all the good thinking behind it around individual interaction or processing tools, working software or comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change or following a plan. Now, come on. If, if you are doing any sort of good practice in system and software, why would you not do that is a question. And what we've then started to do is that on one end, you're looking at a bit more of a purest agile view. On the other hand, you're looking at a very traditional point of view. What is the enterprise level safe zone for you to start to work towards? Now, what we've found is you need to think on all of these variables around or, or attributes, process requirements, solution, collaboration, and team, and define where you are today and where do you want to be. There is That zone's quite big, actually. Yeah. I, and I think um, what I, so one of the problems, I think, is that I don't think that waterfall is wrong in every circumstance or agile is right for every circumstance. I think there are certain models, like the Kinevin framework, we can use to try to assess what, where, where, are, where do I sit in that framework and how do I make sense of what it is that I'm looking at. And part of that is looking at the, if you go too far one way or too far the other way, you can get equally muddled. So just taking that process for example, um, in a totally traditional model, it's all predefined. It's probably in some sort of lovely thudware that hits your desk on your first day mm -hmm. that you're supposed to read. But you only actually ever learn it from the person who sits next to you because they've been there for a while. 
and what happens is those documents quickly become outdated and pointless and really you have this uh, facade of control that's not really there. On the other end you've got Agile which is empirical which is we need to learn as we go along. We need to be inspecting and adapting mm -hmm. but what will happen if you're not careful is uh, we'll just not have any process. We'll just do stuff mm -hmm. because it's a commune and that, that's not right either. So in every one of these um, enterprise level safe zones, you've got to be a bit careful. And I, I've sort of likened it to somebody of when you're playing that crazy golf where you yeah. hit the ball up and it's supposed to stay on the top of the hill and it can yeah. easily just roll either side, neither of which is good. And I think the same true is here with Agile. That if you go too far from, you know, from evolving your solution to, look, let's just start and it will magically happen, no, you end up with the mystery house in, uh, in uh, California. Yeah. So, I think you just have to be careful both ways. Yeah, so I think uh, that's sort of our key message around that if organizations take a bit more of a startup approach, you'll find them more on sort of the true agile side of things, which is fine. It might work for a while. And if you're genuinely co-located, although distributed also works, but if you're small, co-located, doing product development in one location, everything else being equal, that might work for you. On the other hand, I think totally traditional, well, if you guys have joined this webinar, I'm pretty sure that you either want to move from that position or you have already moved from that position, so I don't need to ask that point a bit. The question here is then, how do you fall within that enterprise level safe zone and for the process requirements, solution, collaborative ways of working and team spirit, how do you define what's your answer to that and again, as we said at the very beginning, there are no final answers here. There's a framework, and this is yet another framework we're putting out there for you to look at your organizational change, your culture change. How can you drive that? You might just pick one or two of them to say requirements is my key challenge area. Right now, it's either muddled through, which actually does happen quite a bit. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. So. So either you can when we, when we look at organizational transformations, we look at all of these dimensions. We always start with the as a situation and define the two Bs and the interim states, if you like. But that's sort of the holistic way we look at agile and the kind of organizations we've dealt with who want it to be uh, robust, agile to be robust enough, have found themselves somewhere or the other in that enterprise level safe zone. Yeah. So that's sort of the last slide we have. So about just over five minutes we've got to go. We can open up a question. Yeah. There we go. Time boxed. Time boxed. That wasn't bad. So I presume that we are waiting for the questions to be pushed through on the chat window. Oh, we were so convincing. Everybody just goes, do you know what? Those guys are so right. Yeah, it's all clear. We need to bring them in and help us. That's what they're <laughs> all thinking. Maybe there are enough nuggets to just go in and just do it. Yeah. So there's another good thing. I think it just shows how multi-dimensional and complex this is. So it's um, it's almost, you know, the idea that you can go and rather than trying to come up, spend months coming up with an answer, you have to try stuff, see what works and adapt it. And that, that's sort of the nugget that you need to go in and start. Mm. Okay, so we have started to see the questions come through. So I can make the window big enough. What percentage of companies are moving on movies? Okay. Uh, oh, so what percentage of company? Oh, hang on. Sorry, we got. Oh, sorry. Oh. You have to be able to open that up somehow. Is that there? Make that bigger. Oh, there brilliant. Go. Okay, so we got two questions here. So the first one is, do you have an no. experience of non-software? Oh yeah. So yeah. So um, for <coughs> example, there is. Um, so where I am. I say some of the projects are just 20 to 40 percent um, 
20, a, the 20 to 40 percent technical delivery, and there are third-party software companies, and there's marketing, operational change, all those things are brought together, uh, which is why when people tell you to you you don't need a project manager in Agile, you're sort of wrong. Um, but what you can do and what you do do in those circumstances is make sure that your goals and your objectives are really clear and where you have got bits of the project which are waterfall or third party, you need to be very clear on what your interim goals are and make sure that you're synchronizing and doing your integration all the way through and not as a big bang at the end. So you can certainly do it. Um, one of my colleagues um, is working on something which is almost 100% about process improvement. But what they're looking at is which process, when we change it, will have the biggest impact. Let's do that first, make that live, get that value, and then work on the next thing. Not let's try to work on an enormous project which everybody looks at the end and go, oh, it's just too big. Mm -hmm. So trying to make sure you know where your value is and, and prioritizing and delivering stuff incrementally, absolutely, you yeah. can do that. And, and just uh, not stealing too much of thunder from the keynote we're doing in Agile Business Conference, but you'll have uh, Russ Evans from Legal in General presenting his example, one of which has got nothing to do with software or IT anyway. Yeah. Right, moving on to the next one. So the next one is how do we, scrolling, uh, okay. How do we mitigate the escalating costs associated with multiple tests and, I think there's something else which is, test. okay, so multiple test. Yeah, so multiple, so I presume that if you are doing a lot of test cycles and it's costing you a lot, okay. then there is not as much. Oh, sorry, there's another question. Yeah, there. no, I think it's the same question, but, sure. but actually, yeah, yeah. With the multiple test and deployment cycle. So, I mean, one of the things, if you're doing it very manual, and what you had as a system before, that it was a very manual system, now you're just doing it more of that, then clearly the cost would be higher. And hence, one of the key things we always suggest is to invest in uh, automated tools uh, around certainly testing and deployment, which will bring the cost down. So it's not just doing more of manual, yeah. it has to move to automated. So good example where I am currently, where there was a big test center, and that test center does all lots of stuff at the end, is to pull those guys out into working in the sprints, making sure the guys are doing at least some BDD and automated regression testing. Um, just to put that in context, by doing just those simple things, they reduced the number of defects found during UAT um, from what they would expect for the size of the project from 1,200 to 20. And UAT went from eight weeks to two weeks. The other thing to bear in mind is just because you've got deployable quality software doesn't mean you should, because your customers may not want it. So certainly some finance divisions around the world will go, we can only take an update every three months. And the fact you've written all this software is lovely, but we can't take it. So I think you just have to be uh, really careful about your overheads and make sure you don't deploy stuff when you don't need to. Yeah. Um, some of the projects I'm working on make the deployment every two weeks because they're mobile and web-based. Yeah. So, uh, and it's uh, uh, at a push of a button. Exactly, and I think this is where a lot of organizations, they at least, when we work with them, they find it in one of the two camps. One is around uh, traditional uh, software product development, and some of that is more front end the cutting edge where they have to do this more often. So I think you just need to balance that out. And if you are doing a lot of test cycles, I would actually question that the quality because you shouldn't be requiring to do as many. I think and, and this is might be controversial one, mm -hmm. but I, I, I expect software developers to be able to write software. Mm -hmm. And having somebody who's checking that the software developer has written the right software is, is probably um, wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, so the focus of Agile on, on, on having acceptance criteria, defining what's good, having a definition of done, and making sure that quality is baked in every two weeks, not just at the end, means that everybody's responsible for quality. Yeah. And it's also, we're moving into sort of code generation languages now, so a lot of code should be, at least, uh, we should be, not be writing the lines of code, but be generating those lines of code. So I think that's the other aspect of it, that if, if the systems you're using then don't render themselves very well to an automated test and deployment strategy, then maybe it's also to consider moving on to a completely new platform. Yeah. 
And actually, yeah, the, the other, other the other thing is, if you're focused on value mm -hmm. and outcomes, then the role that the team has is to write the smallest amount of software possible mm -hmm. in order to achieve that goal. Yeah. Therefore, having less points of potential failure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having value-driven value chain organization means that actually you will need fewer test cycles. Yep. Right, so if you're moving on, because we're on the time, and I know we'll start to lose people, so I might have missed it. How do you go about enterprise as our initial step pain points and education? So what we did there was, so we've given several pointers. One is on the screen that you might want to look at all of these aspects and these tangents, uh, attributes of an organization. In terms of actually delivering the change, we also suggested the eight-point change model from Quarter. So that's the other bit. Uh, you might think of education first. Uh, interestingly, uh, what we are experiencing is people don't want to be preached. What they want is pick up a project uh, or a program which is uh, critical enough and, and show the change and lead the way. So people have had quite a bit of education. By the and, I, and I think my, my perspective on that is, especially if we're talking about execs and the people who need to be persuaded, mm -hmm is the sort of normative learning experience. So find people who are doing what you want to do and go and visit so they can go, oh, I see, because you need that sort of light bulb moment where it's not about doing more with less yeah. or just about being quicker. Yeah. That's not the point. It's a whole different way of thinking, and you have to see that in action. And you're probably pointing to your session on the Agile Business Conference on day two a little bit. No, no, no not at all. <laughs> right, okay, so the next one is, uh, sorry, moving to no, safe. I think uh, there was a that was a probably a follow-on from here we go. What percentage of companies are moving onto safe in the UK? Uh, I wouldn't necessarily know that off the top of my head. We've only heard uh, that the, the people. Well, this is an interesting one because actually some people are adopting the model in its entirety. Some people are just getting trained and then cherry picking the things yeah. they think they like. So, I, I think I think that sort of encapsulates the interesting point is if people are moving too safe, yeah. it's the wrong answer. It's the wrong question. Because what you're doing is what you should be doing is is safe is is a point on the road. So for example, do you really want to have twenty teams doing concurrent planning? and being constrained by a five-week release process or five-sprint release process and release trains. and You may not. You might have a web app and other things that can release quicker. What you need to do is synchronize those things and make sure things are aligned and you've got dependencies managed. But to do that, perhaps you want to think about creating properly end-to-end -end focused feature teams. So I think what, what things like SAFE do is really help you get in your head the stuff that you need to sort out but I don't think even SAFE would expect that you adopt it wholesale, but you should have consultants in who understand it and help you through understanding what those, what the impact of some of those things actually are. Yeah, well, this is an interesting point that we discussed about Scrum as one end of the spectrum where you start small and then you bake yeah. uh, more of the structure in. Now, we've given SAFE that the SDM as the yeah. examples where actually you can start big and then you can write size it to your organizational imperative if we, or transformational imperative. So it's just yeah. it's different starting points. Right? It is, and I think, and there are dangers in both. So yeah. if, if you take the uh, if you take a, a sort of a safe a big bang approach top down, then actually are you really creating self empowered teams? Uh, you're probably not. Mm. So it depends on what your organization is, whether your services or product, uh, how you're aligned, where your money comes from, what you, who your customers are. So you need, you can't just, I think, have somebody, oh, that looks good, it's a pretty picture. Mm. Yes, we've got titles in our company which map to that quite nicely. Uh, that looks all right, because I'm not sure you'll see the full benefit of thinking and being agile. Yeah. We've got three more questions to cover, so we'll quickly do that so that we're not keeping you away from lunch for too long. So what do you think about parts of large organizational transitioning to agile, particularly product lines, and how does it work with mix of agile workflows? So we you have seen that firsthand, yep. because you cannot change the whole of the organization straight no. away. You will have parts of the organization will shall remain uh, what falls. Some of the parts will be slower to adopt agile. Yep. And in fact, uh, the important thing is, I almost sound like the Alcoholic Anonymous phraseology there, to say, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, yep. courage to change the things I can, and 
the we wisdom to know the difference. And so that is about that. To understand what parts we can change and, and have have bridges into non agile world of the organization and, and just make them aware of how you're working. But also be very wary that they can potentially slow you down if they're a part of your value stream. So actually in the portfolio planning, it's very important to understand that which is the weakest link in the chain and what would slow you down. So that's the question I would be asking. And I guess so I ask lots more as well. Hmm. So I think, um, you know, product lines, absolutely. Um, and I think one of the dangers is in saying, right, we've got a web team, uh, a mobile team, and, and those are technologies, they're not the business. And if you're not careful, what you end up with is an agile platform team with lots of demand from the business, so the platform ends up as a bottleneck. What you really want is a business value chain aligned people that can do web stuff as part of that value chain. And you can do that incrementally. So you don't have to do that everywhere at the same time. And there may well be areas of the business which are better aligned and are already feeling more of the pain and so more amenable to that sort of transformation. Yeah. So second last question is what kind of circumstances do you think what fall will be more appropriate than agile? Very, very interesting question there. Uh, I, I think what I say is it's always about the mix. So you can think of even a, a framework like SAFE to be more on the watchful side because you're scripting what you're trying to do there, if that's the way you look at it. So I think waterfall is a more plan-driven approach, whereas Agile for me is, is a bit more collaborative, yeah. a bit more responsive-driven approach, value, or maybe a value-driven approach yeah. if I can say that. I think the important is to identify all of Agile is applicable in some situations, some of Agile is applicable in all. Uh, it would be generalizing too much if I can say where all we'll just use agile, where all we'll just work for. So my view on this, sure. Yeah. Do I also have a view? Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> is again, I quite, I quite like. Yeah, this is just something which I've learned, you know, in the last few months. Really, is, is the, looking at the Kinevin framework, which is some software development might be obvious. So you do know all of your requirements up front, and some of that may be, for example, in um, moving infrastructure. So where you've got moving servers, you know, we know we're going to do this, then this, then this. We've got a list. We can follow it. There's best practice for doing it. Um, in the same way that there's a best practice for changing a, a, a bicycle um, chain, mm -hmm. there's a best, most effective way of doing it. There is, I'm sure, some software where that is true. I would, I would ask, why would you not automate that and take yeah. the human interaction away? Well, why not? Yeah. Um, I, and uh, because... In, in many cases, you've got a complex or a complicated um, relationship between the software and what you're trying to achieve. The can we do it waterfall is perhaps not quite the right question. What you can do is start on the process by instead of saying, let's have a nine-month program, let's do three three-month programs, and let's make sure we've got uh, milestones where we are checking stuff as we go along. So there are ways you can balance it. And if you think back to an earlier slide where we went from waterfall to incremental to agile, is you're actually looking at moving from waterfall to an incremental approach, which starts you on the on the process of actually being uh, more. Pro I hate the term properly agile because what is that anyway? I don't think. No. No. Right. Last question there, and we'll let you off then. Will organisations move about in the enterprise safe zone as project develops or culture changes? Absolutely yes. Because you might be coming from more sort of left-wing, uh, agile way of working to maybe coming from right-wing of traditional way of working. And you might move your equilibrium, and not just holistically, but on any of these axes or attributes, if you like. Yeah. So the answer is absolutely yes. Yeah. And, and, yeah, and the, the point to think about is, again, about inspecting and adapting. So for example, saying, do you know what, instead of getting all our money up front for this next project, Let's get it funded in three months tranches and ask for half a million pounds every three months and demonstrate we're building value. And if after three months that's not working, then okay, well perhaps we need to move a bit further to the right again because that's for whatever reason that's not working. So yeah. 
you're really always looking at where you are, making sure that you're not far to the right or far to the left because yeah. you're falling off the top of the putting green. Well, again, uh, it's the framework with which you inspect and adapt. That's it. That was the whole point of it. Yeah. Right. So we're ten minutes over. We've managed to we? we've managed to retain half of the attendees up to another ten minutes for the Q and A. So we must be doing something right. So on that note, if there are no further questions, uh, we can try and call it today. Is that, is that right? Yeah, that's all. Um, okay. Yeah, we'll have a okay. Thank you very much right. indeed, Manav and Stephen. Excellent webinar. And obviously, judging by the number of questions, it's certainly very thought-provoking. I just yeah. remind you that both Manav and Stephen will be at the Agile Business Conference next week, which is in London at 155 Bishopsgate. It's on Thursday, sorry, on Wednesday and Thursday, the 8th and 9th of October. And the theme this year is Agile and Next Frontier. The webinar recording will also be available shortly. We will put a link on the agileconference.org website. That's the main conference website. So if you'd like any more information about the conference and, and in due course the webinar recording it will be available. So once again, thank you very much indeed, Manav and Stephen. Well, thanks, thanks, a lot. And thanks for your participation. If you would like to hackle us in the conference, by all means, we'll have a stand there and we'll also be doing various sessions. So yes, uh, well, now, now that you've seen our pictures and us in action, so <laughs> more, than, more than welcome for you to hackle us on other questions. Thank you. Brilliant. All, All right. right. Thanks a lot, Ben. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye.